Good morning, and welcome to worship with St. Paul's United Church in Riverview, New Brunswick. This is our third Sunday in Lent on March 7th, 2021. And as we do each week to begin worship, we greet each other with the peace of Christ, a peace that surpasses our understanding, but is one of those supports in our lives, one of the elements that we share with each other and that we also share with God, who desires our relationship with God and with each other. The peace of Christ be with you all. And also with you, Andy. Thank you, Steve. It's good to see you. It's always good to see you. Well, I'm glad that we can uh, welcome people to join us again this week. It's been, um, it's been a cold week this week, but also very clear skies with uh, brilliant sun by day and brilliant moon by night. How, how have you been? Well, um, unlike you, I have a dog that demands that I go walk <laughs> at 7, 7.30 in the morning. And uh, she just loves, unlike a lot of dogs, she just loves the winter. And so, and the strong winds, she just puts her face flat into it and just sniffs everything that's on the breeze. And meanwhile, I'm telling her to hurry up. So that's... <laughs> yes, those cool, crisp mornings must feel long. <laughs> oh, they, they do, as, as do the cold, crisp nights, too, at times. But... Uh, no, it, it is particularly beautiful. And, and one of the things that I've noticed and that you will have too, I suspect, is that uh, both of us have lived in northern Alberta at times. And one of the things that always struck me out there was the, was the intensity of the blue in the sky. And some of these days have just, it's just been phenomenal in terms of how blue the sky looks. And so, yeah, it's, it's pretty out there. It's also pretty cold. So yeah, yeah. It's not quite uh, uh, blue skies smiling at me. It's more like uh, blue skies biting me. Uh, it's been so bitter outside at times, especially with the wind. Um, and uh, but I, I I prefer your Annie, uh, your puppy Annie, your dog, uh, and your story about it to my Annie, um, who peed in the basement uh, because she got stuck there by accident and. Uh, Anyway, uh, so different experiences, perhaps, of the deep cold of winter. Uh, yes. <laughs> and, and we're fortunate in terms of the deep cold of winter for us is one where, where we can find refuge. Yes, exactly. Yeah. No, we're very fortunate. That's true. Uh, Steve, what we're looking at this week uh, in terms of our scripture lesson is uh, Jesus cleansing the temple, which is uh, at the beginning of the Gospel of John. Uh, but typically that story is read in the lead up to Holy Week and Easter. And uh, there are many different ways of understanding that story, especially in its context. But I wonder, one of the things that's clearly happening is that Jesus feels there's a need for some kind of change. And he expresses it very emotionally. Uh, I'm wondering, is there, can you think of a, a time or an event or an issue uh, where the church needed to respond or, or had to respond to the need for change uh, in its own sort of cleansing of the temple uh, and maybe just say a little bit about what that experience was. Oh, there, there, have, there have been so many times when I have felt that the church needed to be cleansed. We can be very self-righteous in terms of, I can be very self-righteous in terms of my own perspective about the institution uh, that that we are part of and that is common to, I suspect, virtually everybody who is watching this video. And there have been times when the church really falls so short in terms of responding to the needs of the greater community. Certainly, as I go back in my own history, and looking at what happened in 1988 and the few years that followed that within the United Church around the discussion about the ordination of LGBTQ people in, in the denomination 
and just such a fissure that that came about. And there was a lot of hatred that was still expressed towards members of that community. Um, biases and prejudices. And, and ultimately, what I think we learned from that was that what is important in, in terms of those of us who try to follow the path of Jesus is that Jesus demands of us love and loving one another rather than embarking in hatred of others. And unfortunately, the reality is still true today that there are many churches where hatred still exists as, as a cornerstone in terms of their worldview. I look at what has transpired in some congregations, mainly to the south of us over the last four or five years where race has become a much more significant issue and where there has been a doctrine that has emerged in some where people claim that uh, it's much more about um, the one that really inflames me is that Jesus would pack heat. Jesus would carry gun a gun with him and would support gun owners. Um, the antithesis of, of what he proclaimed as the Prince of Peace as, as we know of him. Uh, so when I look at Churches that twist the word of God, twist the words and the teachings of Jesus to mean everything, anything, and nothing. There is much need for reform. Does the United Church of Canada still need to be reformed? Yes. Over the last many years, we have focused far more internally on our own issues, uh, structural, rather than the issues that that call for us to reach out in justice, as Jesus was in the temple. One of the things that I love about that story is that he overturns the money changers' tables, but he turns to those who were selling doves as a sacrifice, and he tells them to get them out. Doves were the sacrifice of those who lived in poverty. Um, he treats those people differently than he does those who are selling larger animals or for those who are trying to profit off of off of temple worship. So it's it's a wonderful story. It also shows a very human side of Jesus. He gets frustrated at times and and his anger overwhelms him in terms of this. So love the story, would love to get into it much, much deeper, but that's your job this week. <laughs> yeah, that's right. No, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Uh, the um, the uh, One of the mottos of the Reformation was that the church is always in the process of being reformed, of being changed, according to the Word of God. And uh, I think you've, you've pointed to that very well in terms of Jesus' example of love and and, and virtually all of the time, a peaceful uh, sort of demonstration or, or embodiment of that. And even at his most frustrated uh, with sort of officialdom, he was still, it, w it was a protest that caused, that was uncomfortable, certainly, um, but he didn't hurt people. And uh, that's, it's a very, it's a very powerful example. Thank and what it, what it also does point to is there are times when righteous anger is, is an appropriate response to uh, an injustice that is deep and that um, is, is structurally one that where especially those who are on the bottom end, those who are suffering, uh, are, are being taken advantage of by others. Absolutely. Yep. That's an important point and uh, one that we'll be hearing a little bit more about today. So thank you very much, Steve. <laughs> and I look forward to hearing the sermon. <laughs> Thank you. And so as we continue on in this time, let us once, as we always do, turn towards God in prayer. Let us pray. The God of love calls us to a journey of possibility and hope. For ourselves, each other, and this world, we take each step with humility and trust. On this path, there is still longing, fear, and loss. But God promises to be with us 
and blesses us with each other. Let us breathe in the reassurance of God's peace and breathe out our anxiety and fear. Holy One, renew us, we pray. Amen. The reading this Sunday comes to us from the Gospel of John in the second chapter. It's the story of Jesus cleansing the temple. And John writes this. The Passover was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The religious leaders then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. They said to him, this temple has been under construction for 46 years, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, And they believe the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. The gospel of Christ. Thanks be to God. Amen. Rules. We grow up and spend our whole lives learning rules. Our parents lay down the family rules. The police enforce the public rules. Most of the time, we probably don't even really think about them. They become second nature to us, part of our worldview. Although events like this past year of pandemic, during which we've all had to learn new rules for so many things, times like this are rare and interesting, especially as we watch something like sanitizing our hands or wearing a mask go from being a strong suggestion to being a rule. And I say interesting because rules are more challenging when they're fluid or when they're inconsistently enforced. I told my eight-year-old that Ritz crackers are not a suitable breakfast, and she quickly reminded me of the time I had a cookie with my morning coffee. The time I was let go with a warning for speeding is balanced out by the time that I was fined for not coming to a complete stop at a stop sign at the edge of town at 11 o'clock at night on a road with not a single other car in sight. Maybe the only rules more challenging than fluid rules are unwritten rules, the ones we learn often at the hands of embarrassment, from manners at the dinner table to the politesse of public functions. The unwritten rules are among the hardest to learn, no less so because what's expected of us changes according to our age, our job, our gender, even where we grew up. I'm no longer of an age where I can grab four cookies and run around the hall laughing and playing games during coffee and conversation, and more's the pity. What we're considering today, however, is not the rule of law or the rules of polite society, but the way that these and other rules can give rise to injustice. Laws and practices that disadvantage some and oppress others. In part, this is what Jesus was responding to in his anger at the temple. And we'll come back to that in a moment. It's the kind of anger that we see at the mistreatment of people, often within the rules, but enforced differently according to the color of their skin or who they love. And that is a righteous anger, a righteous anger at the breaking of some more fundamental rule, God's law, 
or the greatest commandment, to love our neighbor as ourselves. This was brought to my attention again this week in an article from the Christian Century that gathered the witness of black women, including the authors of Audre Lorde and Brittany Cooper, who gave and give voice to the experience of being black in America, of being silenced and exploited and abused, and nearly all of this according to the rules. In contemporary wilderness places, writers and activists continue to remind us that laws are often designed to serve those who create them, and that we must be attentive to the impact that this has on those who are not well served by them. For a people tired of being treated as second-class citizens, profiled and pigeonholed, disproportionately incarcerated, anger is not only natural, but justified. And while our privilege may make anger of this sort a less familiar or even comfortable experience, we still have to listen to the voices of prophets today who remind us of our responsibility to all God's people. Like the prophets of the Hebrew scriptures, they help us to see what we may in our privilege at times forget, that our created purpose is to live and work and share according to God's ways of peace and justice and plenty for all. This was very much Jesus' message for the temple officials in Jerusalem. In the midst of occupation, a likely target for Jesus' righteous anger at the mistreatment of his people would have been the Roman Empire. And yet the object of his zeal was most often his own people and the system of privilege that some religious leaders of his day upheld. Our scripture lesson today is often referred to as the cleansing of the temple. In the other Gospels, this event serves as the trigger for Jesus' arrest and passion. In the Gospel of John, however, the cleansing of the temple occurs at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And so it serves as a sign of the reformation that he intends, of the rules-based approach to relationship with God that has lapsed into comfortable convention. A convention that allows people to turn a blind eye to the poverty and need in their midst. Now, Jesus bearing a whip and overturning the tables of the money changers is an image that might be uncomfortable to us, violent as it is. But this was not a random fit of rage or an uncharacteristic lashing out from a normally peaceful person. This was a confrontation confrontation with the powers that kept his people from God, from the source of love, and that did so not by barring their entrance to the temple, but by reducing their faith to a set of transactions. The rituals had become empty of true relationship and demanded sacrifices of people who could ill afford them, while demanding little from those who had the power and privilege to change lives for the better. That our rituals should always serve relationship is something that we hopefully remember both in the church and outside of it. For example, within the church, I've noticed over the years that the solemnity and significance of Holy Communion goes hand in glove with the connections that we make after worship often at coffee and conversation. An example from outside the church of how our rituals have to bear out our relationships would be how our observance of Remembrance Day needs to be matched by our commitment both to peace and to supporting those who serve and who have suffered. That is, our deepest desires for others must be reflected in our rituals, both private and public. Although we didn't read it today, the scripture readings for this week 
include the Ten Commandments from Exodus. And these are perhaps the rules underneath all our other rules. And yet the minister and author, Barbara Brown Taylor, suggests that they also function as the collected wisdom or teachings of a people who live in relationship with God and with each other. Indeed, in Scripture, they appear as a gift, a promise, a blessing, a covenant. And they're offered only after God has freed God's people from slavery and has also fed them with manna from heaven, proving again that justice begins with freedom and a full stomach, with fulfilling the basic needs of life for all. The two tablets, like Jesus' greatest commandment, form a pair. On one, who and what God is and how to honor God. And the other, who and what our neighbors are and how to honor them. Each group of teachings shaping the other. So, for example, to have no other gods means that money and power and selfishness should not make their way onto our altars, nor should they be used to exploit others. To keep the Sabbath is to be a wise steward of creation, and it is also to value our lives as a gift. Not bearing false witness maintains trust in our laws, but it also maintains trust among neighbors, people who depend on each other. The commandments then aren't just the basis of societal laws, a list of do's and don'ts. Rather, they are a fundamental teaching about the flourishing of God's gracious gifts and of our common life. So it is with all good rules, all rules that seek to serve the fulfillment of life and that for all people. They do more than tell us what to do. They reveal how to live together. May this teaching bring us closer to the heart of God this Lent and to our neighbors. Amen.
And as a community, let us once again come before God in prayer. Holy One, there are times when people stand in the way of your word. There are times when we are discouraged and disheartened by those who twist your words, your teaching, to mean anything, everything, and ultimately nothing. There are days when we witness injustice and we want to make a difference. There are times when we feel trapped in the face of difficulties because we fear if we respond, we might make the situation worse for ourselves or others. There are times when those who stand in our way or block us from responding, from reaching out in the way that we feel you would call us. These are not new. They are not things that occur to us alone. These emotions, these feelings have been with us from time immemorial. We hear of your story, loving Christ, of standing in the temple, and you could do no other but turn over the tables of the money changers and clear the temple. We ask that your spirit be with us in times when we too feel we can do no other. We ask that you give us wisdom and insight and courage to turn to you first in prayer and to listen to your word, to do what we can, where we can, to continue to pray and to search for a good way forward. Our Lenten journey continues. And even though it is still not easy, in part because of the time we are in with the pandemic, and in part because Lent is a time that is hard, be with us and remind us that this is a time when we are challenged, challenged to examine our world and ourselves. It is a time of sacrifice as a way of remembering all of the sacrifices that Jesus has made to show us your way of peace with justice, compassion rooted in hope, generosity in abundance, and ultimately, the depth of love. And throughout these times, we trust you will be with us, O oh God, guiding, comforting, leading us. We pray for those we love who are in need of healing mercies. Blessed Comforter, we lift up to situations of pain and loneliness in confidence of your amazing grace. We especially pray for those who are alone and also those who are placing themselves at risk so that they may better serve our needs. We pray for places where injustice seems to reign, and we pray for strength for those who risk bringing about a different way, the way of shalom, salam, of your path. We pray too for all who weep and mourn or who feel abandoned and unloved, that they may hear your voice calling and move toward your all-embracing love, and that they may hear your still small voice whispering to them in their troubles of love and compassion. Be with us, loving God, in all of our concerns and celebrations, as together we pray in the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Thank you.
you for joining us for worship this week. It's a pleasure to know that people gather in this way, especially in the midst of what's happening all around us and around our world. Times like this are even more important. We take time to reflect and to sit with God's word and to hear its meaning for our lives today. Thank you for being a part of our continued community here at St. Paul's United. And thank you to all of you who send your emails and cards and messages and phone calls uh, of encouragement to Steve and to me and to the staff. And when you do that for others in the congregation, we are especially appreciative. Reaching out to each other is one of the most important things that we can do at this time, however we're able. Uh, and we appreciate all of the effort that you put into doing that. So thank you. That is so true, Andy, that putting in that effort is so especially appreciated and uh, important as we continue on through this, through this Lenten time. And as I was listening to and knowing that the story today was the cleansing of the temple, I could not help but think of a prayer that... Um, this is a slightly different version of it. Uh, it's known as the Franciscan Prayer for Injustice. And so as we leave, may God bless us with anger at injustice, oppression, and exploitation of people so that we may work for justice, freedom, and peace. May God bless us with tears to shed for those who suffer from pain, rejection, hunger, and war so that we might reach out our hands to comfort them, to turn their pain into joy and into hope. Let us go in peace to love and serve our God. Amen. Amen.